Hello again, everyone. Um, it's kind of hard to believe that 50 years have passed since uh, the North Koreans captured uh, the U.S. Uh, the American uh, spy ship, the USS Pueblo, and that happened on uh, January 23rd, 1968. And I remember when it happened, and I was scratching my head, going, what the heck was that all about? Fifty years later, I'm still scratching my head. Because it's a bizarre story. It really makes no sense. Uh, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist kind of person, but if you are, and this is bread and butter for you, this is meat on the table. Because uh, the story behind the, the Pueblo is just, it's just silly. And then what happened afterwards is equally as silly. It's just <laughs> nothing, nothing adds up. But anyway, uh, like I say, the Pueblo was captured on uh, January 23rd, 1968. And uh, it, it, 1968 was really a bizarre year. Kind of let me, uh, a lot of people don't, you know, that, ha that did live back then, don't understand like how weird it really was. The entire year, 1968. Um, it was just, you know, I was in the Merchant Marine at the time. So I was out in the middle of the water, uh, and the only access to news was either the teletype or um, shortwave radio. We had no satellites or anything back then. So, I mean, everything we got in shortwave radio. So that's the way I picked up on most of this stuff. But later, when I came back, um, then I was reading about all this stuff. But even the shortwave, I'm figuring out what? I can't figure this, you know. Anyway, um, in, uh, let me run down some of the, the things that happened in 1968. Uh, in March, it was the uh, My Lai Massacre in Vietnam. That was a terrible thing. Um, and on April 4th, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And uh, then uh, a B-52 crashed in Greenland and released four nuclear bombs. I mean, they didn't go out, but, you know, there's four nukes out there. Um, and then... Um, the American submarine, uh, the USS Scorpion, uh, sunk and lost 99 men. I mean, that would be a big thing now if we lost a submarine. And it was back then, too. Uh, in June, uh, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. And then in August, you had the famous, at the uh, Democrat convention in Chicago, you had the famous uh, uh, riots. Where actually, I mean, the kids, uh, the, the protesters rioted, but the the police, the Chicago, the Chicago police, they rioted as well. They got out of control. Now, and then um, somewhere along that line, uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson sent another 24,000 soldiers to Vietnam. And then uh, Nixon wins the election in November. Richard Nixon wins. And then all these airliners getting hijacked to Cuba. I counted them up, and there's something like 15 United States commercial airliners that were hijacked to Cuba. And that's just from the U.S., and that doesn't include airplanes from other countries, primarily Colombia, and also American uh, private planes that were hijacked to Cuba. <laughs> and then the Zodiac Killer was running around on the loose. So you had all this stuff going on in 1968, but it all started off with the Pueblo incident on January 23rd. And Uh, the Pueblo now is docked in uh, Pyongyang, and uh, they've made a museum out of it. They spruced it up quite a bit, and uh, it looks like they've done a really good job. Uh, they put it uh, on a river near the Fatherland War Memorial Museum, and they put a casement around it. So it's like a concrete wall thing to protect it. So they're going to preserve it, uh, you know, like any other ship museum does. And uh, I mean, there it is, setting it its own special area. And uh, it's kind of uh, okay because uh, on, the, on, the, um, on the positive side, it provides gainful employment to uh, some attractive uh, young ladies who uh, uh, are tour guides. And they take you around and show you various things and whatever. And, uh, you know, it gives them jobs. So, you know, 
when you uh, when you get lemons, uh, make lemonade, right? That's what the North Koreans do. So, but anyway, um, the events behind the capture. I mean, you can read it yourself. Uh, I've left a link here on a. Uh, this is an article uh, that makes really interesting reading uh, from the um, from the U.S. Uh, Naval Institute. And this was published in August of 2014, and the title is uh, The Pueblo Scapegoat. So this is from the U.S. Naval Institute. This isn't some crazy, uh, you know, publication. This is right from the United States government. And uh, it makes for interesting reading, and I'll leave a link below so you can link to it if you, if you want to read more about it. But... Um, but uh, the Pueblo was uh, captured just off Juan San, which is uh, on the east coast of uh, North Korea right there. And, uh, and here's the positions that the, uh, the Pueblo reported. It came, I think, on the 20th of January, and then there's five red X's. And then I put a yellow arrow where the final X uh, was on the uh, 23rd on noon. And that's when the North Koreans grabbed it. So I've been goofing around out there for like three days at least. And um, North Koreans uh, said, well, it strayed into their waters. And the American says, no, 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 it was outside the, the territorial limit, which is um, 12 nautical miles or 13.8 statute miles, I believe, something like that, a little less than 14. Uh, so uh, North Koreans said, well, it was it, it, inside, it was inside the, the limit. They, they went inside too close to our, to our, you know, and who do you believe? You know, uh, I don't know. But, you know, it really doesn't matter whether the U.S. Uh, went too close or was far enough, you know, if they were outside or inside the boundary. It really doesn't matter. Um, here's a map of, uh, that I took from uh, Google of the Boston area. And here's what the red X is where uh, the 12 nautical miles would be. Now ask yourself what happened if what would happen if the Chinese put a spy ship right there. The Coast Guard would be on them, you know, in, 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 in 10 minutes the Coast Guard would be out there. Well, what's going on? And chase them away, even though they were outside. See, because if you draw a line from Gloucester to Provincetown, that's in that water, and even though that's probably international waters, 12 miles away from any land, it's still within an area. And maybe the North Koreans felt the same way, you know, I mean, well, okay, you might be 12 nautical miles away from Wonsan, but you're still in that body of water there where we can draw a line from, you know, from one to the other, and that's our protected area. So it, it really, you know, it's, it's an argument that, I don't know, you know, you can make on either side. But, um, but you know, I'm, I won't recite the whole Pueblo incident here. Um, you know, you can read it and what happened, but I'll read parts of this for you. Um, to begin with, the Pueblo was kind of a rust bucket. You know, it was 177 feet long, I think. Here's the specs for it. Uh, it was uh, Ager 2, A-G-E-R-2, and Ager stands for Auxiliary General Environmental Research, and uh, it was built in 1944, which is a rust bucket, like I said. It was, its top speed was 13 uh, knots, and they had two, this total armament was two 50 caliber machine guns, and they didn't even have a, a shield in front. They were just naked out there, mounted, and... Um, they said uh, that, that the, the cover was that there were, uh, it was for oceanography. Uh, they were going to conduct oceanography research, whatever that is, probably. I don't know. So that was the cover purpose of the boat. Meanwhile, it was eavesdropping on North Korean radar positions, mostly. And this was a job that was done by submarines. And the commander, uh, Lloyd Butcher, um, he was a sub guy. He had been on several missions on submarines uh, that had done the same sort of uh, snooping, uh, intel snooping, uh, or what they call signet, uh, si uh, signals intelligence, 
but they'd taken submarines and they'd crept close to the uh, Soviet Union and they had picked up on their radar signals and, and analyzed them. And because Butcher had been a sub guy doing these missions close to the Soviet Union, now they stick them on a ship. I mean, that was one of the bizarre things. They stick them on this little rust bucket and go, we want you to do the same thing you did on the subs, except do it on this rust bucket here and go right into close to North Korea. <laughs> See, I, and he did it. <laughs> well, he's got it. He's a, he's a, he has to follow orders. Um, but anyway, like I said, here's part of the article. And... Uh, there was 81 officers and enlisted men, plus two civilian oceanographers. Those were for cover, right? And um, the Pueblo lacked a rapid destruction system. In other words, there was no way to get rid of the stuff if they got captured. They're all their equipment and their papers. Uh, the sailors had only fire axes, sledgehammers, two slow paper shredders, and a small incinerator. And... Um, and in fact, um, Butcher, before he was sent out, he said, well, where's the incinerator to burn the papers in case we get caught? And they said, yeah, you don't need one. So he went out and bought one out of his own money. I think it's uh, wherever he was, South Korea or something. Um, uh, yeah, he, here he was. Uh, the Navy had repeatedly assured Butcher that a communist attack on his ship was highly unlikely. He had also been told that if he did come under fire, he was on his own. And uh, shortly before the Pueblo's departure from uh, Yokosuka, Japan, our Rear Admiral Frank L. Johnson, who supervised spy ship expeditions in the region, warned Butcher not to start a war by provoking the always touchy North Koreans. So here's uh, Rear Admiral Johnson said, well, we're going to send you out there in this rust bucket. Get as close as you can to North Korea, but don't piss them off. And if you do piss them off, you're on your own. We don't know who you are. We're going to disavow it. <laughs> so Butcher's put in a bad situation. And um, so what happened is that uh, uh, <laughs> they got attacked. And uh, Butcher tried defending the ship, but like I say, he's only got these two 50 caliber machine guns. And here's uh, pictures of them. Um, here's one, there's a, a, a Korean tour guide, she's standing by one, and then here's another, and she's holding uh, one of the handles. But right there, you can see that these two pitiful 50 caliber machine guns with no protection, and Butcher was expected to send his men out there to defend his ship when it was being attacked by three or four North Korean sub-chasers plus a couple of MiG fighters, strafing the hell out of them. And, he's, and he got, that's why he was court-martialed, because he didn't defend his ship. And he's going, well, first you told me I'm on my own. You don't give me any protection. You don't give me any kind of fighter cover. You don't do nothing for me. You tell me to not piss off the North Koreans, and then if I do, well, you're on your own. So what do you expect me to do, you know? I mean, and he lost one guy. One guy got hit in the leg and bled to death. So he had to give up the ship. <laughs> Otherwise, it would just been a slaughter. You know, all their deaths, if, if, even if he survived. And, uh, and the North Koreans was still got the ship, you know, no matter what. So he surrendered. And that's what the problem was all about. Um, but yeah, he was stuck out there by himself. Interestingly enough, um, I thought I had a rough upbringing when I was a kid. I mean, I had tough times. But Butcher, I mean, he got me beat. Um, he was born in Poc Pocatello, Idaho in 1927. And he'd been orphaned as a toddler. And a, a couple that ran a ref restaurant, they adopted him. Uh, but his, uh, his new mother soon died, and his father was in prison for being a bootlegger. So uh, at age seven, the boy found himself without parents or a home and survived by foraging for food in restaurant trash cans and sleeping in cardboard shelters. This is how Lloyd Butcher grew up. And then he finally got sent to, uh, he got sent to um, Boys Town 
for you, those of you who are familiar with Boys Town. He got sent to Boys Town, the Catholic home, and uh, or whatever that was. And then um, he played on the football team. He served as captain. And then uh, uh, he enlisted in the Navy at Pearl Harbor. So Butcher was a good guy and he was a great American. But he was stuck out there in a bad situation. And um, yeah, like I say, you can um, read the article, clip to it, read it. And here's where it kind of gets a little more bizarre, is that um, the, uh, the, the crew of the Pueblo was released, I believe, on January or December 23rd, um, 11 months to the day. And uh, the United States signed all kinds of things, you know, apologizing, we're sorry we intruded on your water, and, 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 yeah. and then once they got their guys back, then the United States immediately disavowed everything they'd signed. They said, forget about it, no matter what we sign, fuck you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and the North Koreans are going, what? I thought we had a deal. And uh, so anyway, <laughs> but what's interesting is that the Pueblo stayed tied up in one sand until um, October 1999. And then somehow the North Koreans got a hold of the Americans and said, look, uh, we want to take the uh, Pueblo from one sand over to Pyongyang, which is on the other side, you know, on the west coast. Over there in Nampho, they put it in Nampho and then they made its way up the uh, Taeyang River to Pyongyang. Uh, now, but the only way we can get the Pueblo over to Pyongyang is we have to take it all around the end of the peninsula and back up the other side. Is that okay with you? And the United States got back to the North Korea and said, okay, fine, whatever, you know, take it around. We have no objections. So the North Korean says, fine. So they towed, in international waters, they towed the Pueblo all the way around down the bottom of the tip of South Korea and back up the other side in the naval. And the United States made no effort to grab it. So then it sat in Nampo and Pyongyang for a while, and with nothing being done with it. And then in 2005, the North Koreans again got a hold of the Americans and said, look, we'll give you the Pueblo back, but what we want in return is a, is a visit from the Secretary of State. And the American says, no way. I can't give you to do that. You know, a visit from the Secretary of State for the Pueblo? What kind of a deal is that? So North Korean says, okay, fine. Have it your way. So then um, they didn't, actually, the, the North Koreans didn't start, they took the, the, the Pueblo and they kind of docked it in Pyongyang there for quite a while. They didn't do anything with it until, um, I think, 2012, just a few years ago. And then they built that uh, Fatherland War Museum, which is up on the side there. And you can see here on a little map. And they, uh, so then they took the Pueblo around and docked it in front of their war museum. And then they painted it and, and they turned it into a museum, which is really nice. I mean, you'd look at the pictures of it and they've got, you know, it looks really nice. They've got cases, they've got um, uh, cases holding the uh, display cases with these soldiers' uh, uniforms. And everything is spruced up really nice. And, uh, and like I say, they've got it behind a wall. They build a special wall to contain it, to protect it. And personally, I'd like to see him fly an American flag from it because the Pueblo is actually still commissioned. Uh, it's still a commissioned ship in the United States Navy. It hasn't been written off. And it's like, I think there's only two, maybe three, two. One of them is, a, what is the U.S. Constitution uh, in Boston Harbor, Old Ironsides. Uh, that's still commissioned. And the... Uh, Pueblo is so commissioned. So to my way of thinking, the North Koreans can really stick a finger in the eye of the Americans by running up an American flag on it. You know, just to say, okay, fine. It's a commissioned ship that we've got. We've got your commissioned ship. <laughs> and uh, I mean that, oh man. Yeah, talk about, anyway, you get the idea. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a strange deal. The whole thing where they they uh, they put Butcher out there on his own, and you know if you get caught, you're on your own. You know we don't know who you are. Um, I 
you know, like I say, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but there's a part of me that said this was kind of a rogue operation by somebody uh, that wanted to reopen hostilities with North Korea. So they said, well, if we get this ship in there with these guys and North Korea captures it, then that'll be a precipitating factor. Then we can reopen hostilities. Because keep in mind, in, in, on July 27th, 1953, uh, when the shooting war stopped, on the Korean War, when the shooting stopped, it was only an armistice. There was no peace treaty signed. You know, unlike uh, the U.S. and Vietnam, the Paris Peace Accords, that was a peace treaty between the United States and Vietnam. And now the United States has an embassy in uh, Hanoi or Saigon somewhere there. Um, so. Uh, but there's no peace treaty, so the war is still, it's still in a, it's still in a formal state of war. So maybe somebody thought, well, if we push that ship out there and get them caught, then that'll start the war up again, and then we can solve this Korean problem, North Korean problem, like they're still trying to do today. I mean, they still talk about making surgical strikes. They talk about giving North Korea a bloody nose. They talk about taking out their you know, their nukes. So there's still this idea of uh, there's elements in the United States military, the United States government that want to attack North Korea again. So maybe that's what the Pueblo incident was all about. You know, if we send these guys out there in this rust bucket, uh, maybe that'll start things up again. Because they could have just as easily done what the Pueblo was doing in uh, near Juan San could just as easily been done with the submarine. You know, piece of cake because they were doing it uh, up against the Soviet Union. So it made no sense to send the Pueblo out unless somebody was wanting to start something. And I mean, that's, that's the best I can come up with it. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, it's kind of interesting um, that, um, that the North Koreans didn't get around to really doing anything with the, uh, with the Pueblo until just a very few years ago. And they said, okay, fine, we'll turn it into a museum. <laughs> you know? I mean, they were, when it was docked before, docked uh, in Pyongyang, it was still, people could still visit it, but they didn't really do it up. It was still all in the original shape. And now they've done it up and made it real pretty and uh, painted it and everything. So, uh, Anyway, that's uh, that's the uh, that's my take on the USS Pueblo, and uh, you know I'd really like to see it someday. It'd be an interesting thing to see, and uh, more than anything, um, listen to what the North Koreans have to say about it and their version of it. I'm sure it'd be it'd be uh, probably you know <laughs> you know they'd probably get most of it wrong. But it would still be fun to listen to. Uh, so anyway, like I say, link to the article. And, uh, and as always, uh, thanks for watching. And uh, I'll see you in the next video.